So I'm going to do a little bit of an intro to chemical bonding here. I'll be honest, there's not a ton for us to actually do, so it will both mostly be me explaining the notes. Um, there will be a couple things that we actually go over with some graphs, but most of it is just me explaining the notes that you have in front of you. So we're going to start from the very beginning. There are three types of chemical bonds. Okay. Chemical bonds are connections between the atoms. They're what we call intramolecular force. Intra, and we'll talk more about that. You don't really capitalize that A, but I'm just doing that because we're also going to talk about intermolecular forces um, in the future. So an intra just means within a molecule. So there are going to be three major categories of bonds, metallic, ionic, and covalent, okay? Let's talk a little bit about what they are. So metallic bonds are metals, atoms of the same metal, okay? So different metals do not bond. They can form mixtures called alloys, which we'll go over in a few minutes. So the electrons are delocalized, which means they are free flowing. So you will have these little electrons in here and they can move around because they're so tiny, they can kind of move around. That is why the metals will conduct electricity, okay? And metal compounds are made up of the same metal over and over and over and over and over again, okay? They are pure substances. Alloys is going to be a mixture, okay? So when we say gold, copper, silver, we're talking about the pure substances, but then alloys we'll get into in a few minutes. They do conduct electricity and heat because the delocalized electrons will flow, so you don't need to do anything to them to get them to conduct electricity and heat, unlike ionic compounds, which we'll get to in a minute, okay? And then metallic bonding creates large, large atomic networks. So let's talk about the properties of a metallic bond. They have metallic ions into highly ordered networks of crystal lattices, okay? So that, that will mean you'll have an atom here, 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 and so on, and they'll all be connected like that. That's what it means by crystal lattice. So, the more metallic atoms you have, the smaller the radius will be because they'll be packed into one space, okay? The more atoms you have, the more there, more electrons there are, which makes sense because every atom is going to give off a certain amount of electrons, okay? And these words will come up a little bit today as well. Lustrous just means shiny. Ductile means it's stretchable. You can put it into wires. Malleable means it's bendable. They have high boiling point and melting points. And that's because we have these very strong positive ions that the metals make with these electrons. So these positive and negatives are attracting each other. They are solids at room temperature, except for mercury is a liquid. You, you do need to know that, that mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And they're insoluble. Okay, let's move on to ionic bonds. Ionic bonds, in ionic bonds, electrons are transferred. The cations lose electrons. The anions gain electrons. You can see the electronegativity, the ionization energy. And then the different types of ionic compounds you could have. This should be familiar from your first year chem class, okay? Ionic compounds conduct electricity, but only when they're dissolved in water. Because when they're not dissolved in water, like if you just have a big old pile of salt and you put an elect a conductivity meter in it, nothing's going to happen because there's no electrons moving around there. But as soon as you dissolve and those ionic compounds dissociate, then there are electrons moving around, and electricity is just movement of electrons, 
Okay, so as soon as you dissolve it and it dissociates, that's when the electricity starts. So here are some properties of ionic bonds. They are brittle, meaning they're easily breakable. So like salt, you can easily break it up when you're cooking or whatever you're doing with regular salt. Okay. They are soluble in water, but insoluble in alcohol alcohol or oil, any other nonpolar solvent. Covalent bonds are between non-metals. So most of those are anions except for hydrogen. Covalent bonds electrons are shared. And they will always be non-metals. Covalent compounds do not conduct electricity because their electrons are shared, so they do not move, okay? There are exceptions that are network solids, graphite, diamond. Again, network was more like that crystal lattice thing where you have an atom here, 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 and they're all connected. Mo and you also have, there's two kinds of types of covalent bonds. There's molecular covalent, which would mean you would have an atom like that. And then over here, again, okay, and network. Network also has those types of bonding, okay? So molecular is easier to dissolve in water, Co uh, network is not. So here are some properties of covalent bonds. Low boiling and melting point because of their IMFs, which we're gonna get to in our last unit of the year. They can have different states of matter. Some of them will dissolve in water or polar solvents if they are polar. And then nonpolar ones will dissolve in oils or nonpolar solvents. So like dissolves like. You probably remember that from your first year. Polar dissolves polar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if it's a polar covalent compound, we say it dissolves in water. It does dissolve in water. If it's a nonpolar covalent compound, it dissolves in nonpolar things like oil. Okay, so here's just a little chart that kind of summarizes everything we were talking about. Whether it conducts electricity, different examples, melting points and boiling points. You have this in your notes, so I don't think I need to go through it again. Okay, so now we're getting into our intramolecular forces and potential energy. Intramolecular forces are the forces within a molecule. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Okay, negatively charged electrons are repelled by other electrons but attracted to the nucleus. So there's these competing forces in a molecule. Covalent bonding is the result of a balancing act between those competing forces. You also have the idea that atoms want to bond because they end up becoming more stable, so that kind of pushes them in the right direction. But an intramolecular force is both the repulsion and the attraction. The repulsion of the negatives and negatives from each atom, and the positive and positive from each atom. And then the attraction when you have negatives from one atom and positives from the other. So there are those competing forces. So here is just a little bit of a model there. Those dark circles are the electrons and then you have the cloud. So you can see that this electron cloud is attracted to this nucleus, this electron cloud is attracted to this nucleus, but then you also have a little bit of repulsion here and repulsion between these two. So what we're going to end up having is the optimal distance, okay, where that balancing act is optimal. So the balancing act between them, between the repulsion and the attraction, gets to a certain point where they can actually form a bond. And that's going to be our bond length. This brings us to a curve. This is a Morse curve, okay? 
So this is just for a generic diatomic molecule. We have two atoms here. So this right here, so the potential energy is on the y-axis, and the distance between the nucleus is on the x-axis. So you are going to hit a point where the distance is optimal, and that point is down here. The, minim, the minimal energy, minimum energy, is where the distance between the two nuclei is optimal, where you would find the bond length. So then if you go ahead up with your little dashed line, this isn't part of the curve, this is just a dashed line to show you that this is where you would find your bond length, the distance between the two nuclei at the optimal, the minimum energy. Okay, so minimum energy, go ahead up here, that's the bond length. Okay, if you are closer, so lower than the bond length, there's a huge amount of repulsion, okay, so we're not going to have a bond there. And then as you get further and further away, they're just not going to be attracted enough. So here there's too much repulsion, here there's not enough attraction. So you need to go right here. So here's a little bit of an explanation of those curves. And then this is another thing I want to highlight. Shorter bond lengths are generally stronger bonds. Okay, which is, means they're going to take more energy to break, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So let's talk about structures of ionic solids. These are going to be particulate diagrams, and that brings us to something called lattice energy. Lattice energy is going to be the energy that is required to break these bonds of ionic compounds. Okay, Lattice can be shown with Coulomb's law, which is great because we already understand Coulomb's law. So what you're going to do for a... Uh, Lattice energy for an ionic compound is you take the charge of the cation and the charge of the anion. So you already know, like for lithium fluoride, for example, lithium gets a plus one charge, fluoride gets a minus one charge. And then you take the distance between the two atoms. That's going to be based on what you already know about atomic size. Okay, so last unit we talked about how if you go down a group, the sizes get bigger. So you can see that as you go down a group, Cl is going to be bigger than F. So that means this distance is going to be bigger, right? So if this distance goes up, then the lattice energy goes down. So same formula here. And you can see that the lattice energy does go down. And then I is even bigger. So the lattice energy goes down some more. Because the bigger the atoms, the bigger the distance will be. And the distance is just the distance between the nuclei. So like if you have more energy levels on one of the atoms, you're going to have a bigger distance. So let's take a look at some of these types of questions. Lattice energy value for NaF is 910. For MgO, it's 37.95. Now, the sizes are kind of are similar here. Okay, Mg and Na are kind of similar, O and F are similar. So we're not really going to talk too much about distance, but the other part of Coulomb's law is charge. So here for NaF, you have plus 1 and minus 1. For Mg, you have plus 2 and minus 2. You can just pull those charges right off the periodic table. So this is going up because the charges for MgO go up, which means the lattice energy goes up. Okay, so because they're, are, they're kind of similar in sizes, we can just say that it's because of the charges. So let's take a little bit more of an in-depth look at a Morse diagram. which is just a potential energy versus bond length graph. That's what we were just talking about. Okay, 
So this question is asking which graph, red or blue, represents a stronger bond? So remember that these spots right here are the bond length. Okay? Well, incorrect. These spots right here are the bond length. Sorry. So you go from the bottom of the curve to right here. So that means the blue one has a shorter bond length than the red one. And we said that the blue, or the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond is going to be in general, okay? So the blue one here is going to be the stronger bond because it has a shorter bond length. So let's keep going with this comparison graph. If, if, you, if you're told that one of these represents Cl2 and one represents Br2, could you tell which is which? You absolutely can. Cl2 is going to be the blue one. Br2 is going to be the red one. And you know that because as you go down a group, atoms increase in size. So Br is bigger and it's going to have a bigger bond length. So we already did this part. And so you can see that the red one has a bigger bond length, so it's going to be the bigger atom. Okay? So this is just a, a kind of throwing that out there. Stronger bond as you go down. Longer bond as you go across. All right. Let's talk a little bit about this particular diagram. So this is a little bit different than our other particular diagram. And I believe we have gone over this before, but I just want to say, just want to show you again. So this is the breaking up of KCl. So we have the energy we need. We're dissociating it, okay? Putting it in water, adding water. And then you always want to make sure that if you're asked to draw these types of diagrams, you're pointing the water in the right direction. So Cl minus is minus, okay? So if KCl breaks up, it dissociates. So you want to make sure the, H, the Hs, which are plus, are going to be facing the Cl minus. And then here, K is plus, so you want to make sure the oxygens, which are minus, are going to be facing the K plus, okay? And down here, you can see it's labeled with the partial positive on the hydrogens and partial negative on the oxygens. So just a quick note about dissolution diagrams, because we're kind of on that topic right now. All right, so now we'll talk about alloys. And you can read through this. It's in your notes. So alloys are mixtures of metals. You melt the mixtures, you melt the metals, and then you put them together and cool it so that they're all mixed up together. It's just, it's basically a mixture of a metal. They are used all the time. It makes the metal a lot stronger. Okay, so steel is a lot, is used all the time. Um, you can see the gold and jewelry, stuff like that. A special word for an alloy is an amalgam which is made out of mercury. So here are some common alloys and their percentages. Cast iron, stainless steel, surgical steel, that's used to, like, for your teeth fillings, brass, bronze, pewter, so on. There are two types of alloys. An interstitial alloy has the lattice structure or the covalent network, I mean the network, not covalent, but the network already set up, right? And you can see that that hasn't changed. So these little shaded, light shaded ones are the metal atoms. So whatever the primary metal was, it's like that. And then... What happens is the other metal that you're mixing with it goes in between those. Okay, so it doesn't upset 
the structure, that lattice structure, it goes in between them. Substitutional alloy, you have the lattice structure, but you'll notice that it's not all of those faint gray ones. It has some dark ones replaced. So instead of going in between, it actually replaces. And that's, it substitutes. That's why it says substitutional. So it replaces some of those atoms. And you can see the differences here. It's important that you know these terms and that you know the differences. All right, so here's just an explanation of those two types of alloys. When they say impurity, sometimes it's something we want. We want the impurity because it helps make it stronger. And sometimes it's something we don't want, and that's the mixtures that we did last unit. So you can kind of ro read through this. Solids are always going to be more stable when the atoms are filling the space more efficiently. And then something important to know is that an alloy is when we are actually strengthening the metal. If we weaken it, we're just calling it a mixture. So here are some alloys and the type of structure. You can tell the difference. So something I want you to know with this is, if they are close in atomic radii, then it's going to be substitutional, okay? Oops, because they're going to actually replace each other because they can't fit in between. But if they're not close in atomic radii, like here it's 156 and 67, that smaller carbon atom can easily fit in between the iron. So that's going to fit in between. Okay, and then here you can see that there are many, but they're all in the same range. And then for the other one, there are two that are going to be substitutional, and then one that is not. So this one has, stainless steel has both. So that's the easy way to tell what type you are looking at. Either looking at the atomic radii, or looking at a picture, you would be able to tell which is which.